Uh, so we'll move on to, to the next speaker. Uh, that is Dr. Kathy Head. Uh, Dr. Head is a consultant cardiologist uh, specializing in adult congenital heart disease. Uh, she's the lead cardiologist for the Norfolk and Norwich uh, Maternal Medicine Center. Uh, Dr. Head, many of you will know, is the immediate past president of the UK Maternal Cardiology Society, uh, and she led the society from its creation up until a few days ago uh, at the BCS. She's also Embrace UK Cardiology Assessor, the Embrace Report we discussed earlier today. Uh, and uh, Dr. Head will talk us through pre-pregnancy counseling and risk assessment. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us in the middle of your clinic. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much for the, uh, the invitation to join. Uh, and I realized that joining at the end of the previous talk that my understanding of family planning may not have been the same as yours. And so I've left out contraception in my talk, but I'm very happy to answer any questions about it uh, afterwards. So without further ado. Could someone just let me that you let me know that you're seeing my slides OK? Yes, perfectly. OK, so I'm talking about pre-pregnancy counselling and risk assessment in inherited cardiac conditions. And uh, Antonio has introduced me. So what we're going to talk about in this session is pre-pregnancy counselling, during which we'll cover generic and lesion specific risk assessment. And the lesions that I'm really going to talk about are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated, restrictive and ARVC. I'm also going to talk about aortopathy and I'm going to briefly mention the inherited iron channel disorders. And I suppose it's just worth spending a second thinking, why are we talking about this? And it's because cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of maternal death in the UK. And if you look at those causes, you'll see that a significant proportion are inherited cardiac conditions. So we usually have between 10 and 15 percent of deaths caused by aortic dissection uh, and around 20 percent by myocardial disease, predominantly cardiomyopathy. And you know, deaths, yes, we're very fortunate in the UK that we have a low maternal death rate, but some of it is still preventable. And of course, deaths are the tip of the iceberg and there is a larger amount of morbidity underneath. OK, so when you do pre-pregnancy counselling with a woman or a couple, you're talking about the effect of pregnancy on the heart and the effect of the heart disease on the pregnancy, maternal risk, fetal risk and genetic counselling that you've been hearing about, and whether you can modify any of these risks by intervening preconception, both surgically or in terms of catheter intervention. Are there any medication changes necessary before conception? And then you make a plan for antenatal care, delivery planning and a postnatal care. So let's just start with some of that and think about maternal risk assessment. You can, you can assess maternal risk by using scores by using condition specific data, which in some conditions may be very extensive and in some may be incredibly limited. And you can also use the basic principles of physiology onto which you put the, the principles of pregnancy physiology that you've heard about today. So the point that I want to make about scores, if we start with those, is that risk scores overestimate risk. And that's something that I think that many of us in the field have empirically understood, but this is a nice piece of work that shows it and proves it. So this is a piece of work published in Heart a few years ago, which took two of the most commonly used risk score, CARPREG, that's Canadian, and Zahara, that's European. Um, and these are risk scores which take risks for specific cardiac features like LV outflow tract obstruction, LV impairment, arrhythmia, so that they're not lesion specific at all. And they calculated the predicted outcome based on the risk score and then they waited for the pregnancy to complete and they compared this against the actual observed outcome. And what you can see is that it once you everybody agrees on what low risk is, but once you get to a predicted outcome of 40 percent predicted maternal complications, it's actually overestimating by a factor of two. And that's the same at 80. So risk scores overestimate risk at anything other than the lowest risk by a factor of about two. So I find it personally more useful to use the modified WHO criteria, which is a classification of maternal cardiovascular risk. This is from the ESC guidelines of 2018. And you've got risk class going from one, which is basically background population risk, to four, which is extremely high risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity, 
such that pregnancy is contraindicated and you should, women should be advised against it. Um, and I just put a couple of the conditions we'll be talking about here and map them to where they are. So, you know, uncomplicated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy comes in at two, which is only a small increased risk. DCM with mild LV impairment and good functional capacity comes in at two to three, really, you know, often two. And then, you know, with the aortopathies, you've got the risk, as we'll hear about later on in the talk, is determined by the diagnosis and the maximum dimension of the aorta as well as the patient's history. So if you've got a smaller aorta, you're coming in at a three, but if you've got a significantly dilated aorta with Marfan syndrome, you're a four, as you are if you've got severe LV impairment. So this is something that actually has used lesion specific data to, to give you some kind of estimate of risk. You can also assess by basic principles, which is very useful, I think. You can think about all the things that are required in pregnancy, as you've heard about in a previous talk, and wonder if the specific lesions that the woman has can, can manage that, can achieve it. So, for example, you need to increase your cardiac output. So in order to do that, you need adequate LV systolic function. You need not to have inflow or outflow tract obstruction. You need to have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. And the best way to assess this is functional capacity and hemodynamic response to exercise, so treadmill or cardiopulmonary exercise testing. You also need to be able to tolerate volume expansion, which becomes a significant issue in inflow obstruction, such as mitral stenosis, but also for the purposes of this talk, in diastolic dysfunction, in hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy. Cyanosis is actually much more of a fetal than a maternal risk. You need to think about, are you at increased risk of aortic or coronary dissection? Do you have connective tissue disease? Are you at increased risk of thromboembolism or arrhythmia? And to these basic principles, you can then add your lesion specific data. Once you've done all that, you're hoping to populate something that looks like this, which is a complex delivery care plan. I've, I've crossed something out because this is when we used to give antibiotics routinely in certain situations for prophylaxis. And in this care plan, this, this is just a bit of an aid memoir as to what you should be thinking about. What is the planned mode of delivery? What do we need to do about medication? What monitoring should she have? And what should you do particularly, so in the first stage, but the second stage, and then the third stage? What uterotonics are okay to give? So you're looking in all the pre-pregnancy counseling and risk assessment and planning you're doing to populate this kind of document. So if we start from the top with that, when we think about pre-pregnancy counselling and delivery planning, let's answer this question. Is a planned caesarean section in women with cardiac disease beneficial? So should all these women be having elective caesarean sections or a significant number of them? And you will find in this field that women will come to you with the request or the expectation that they'll have to have a caesarean because it will be safer for their heart. In fact, that's not the case. And this is the ESC registry, which reported on over a thousand pregnancies over a five year period and found that there was no maternal benefit. And in fact, there was fetal compromise because the feet because of iatrogenic prematurity, there was lower birth weight because of the lower gestational age and that vaginal delivery should be the planned mode of choice in most cases, except for these cases, which we'll discuss later. So aortopathy, aortic aneurysm and dissection, I think we're all agreed on that because what you're doing with a caesarean is stopping the blood pressure surging of pushing. These are more controversial. Uh, the warfarin is an obstetric decision. This is, relates to the fact that the fetal liver clears warfarin less quickly than the, than the maternal liver because the fetal liver is immature. And so a fetus will be anticoagulated for longer than their mother. They'll still be anticoagulated after the woman's INR has fallen. And so this is about risk of fetal intracranial hemorrhage. Severe left ventricular failure. Certain of the guidelines will tell you you can consider it or you should consider it an elective caesarean section. My personal practice and view is that it should, that's an individual decision and symptom limited is probably the best way to go on that. But the, the Bottom line here is that there are, of course, many obstetric indications for caesarean section, elective caesarean section, which is not, you know, as, as, as a cardiologist, my, my business to comment on. But there are very few cardiac indications for planned caesarean section. 
While we're on the subject of delivery planning, we need to be thinking about what do we do about the second stage of labour, which is the act, the active pushing. The second stage has two stages. It has the, the passive descent of the head at the beginning and then the active second stage which is the pushing. And should we be limiting that in cases where blood pressure surges may be harmful? So, for example, aortopathy, aortic dissection. And you can do this by saying there's no pushing. So you allow passive descent of the head and then you lift out with forceps or von twos, which needs to be planned because you really should have a, a, an epidural in for that. Or should you time limit? Now, many of us, many people, you know, have been in units or have themselves or grown up with the limitation for a half hour limitation. There is no evidence to support that. Uh, and again, I think it needs to be an individualised decision as to whether you want no pushing, whether you want the minimum pushing or whether pushing is symptom limited, for example, in somebody with, with left ventricular failure or, or aortic stenosis. So those are some of the generic issues and we can clearly talk about those more in the discussion. But I'd like to move on now to, to briefly cover several of the most important inherited cardiac conditions. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, I don't need to define to this audience, but what we're looking at in this situation when we're thinking back again about breaking it down into basic principles is systolic function, diastolic function, arrhythmia risk and outflow tract obstruction. And as is so often the case, the best predictor of morbidity is your status pre-pregnancy. And in all the large series, you see that the hokum is very well tolerated with a mortality of, of half a percent and complications of up to 30 percent. But actually, these, some of these are quite quite insignificant complications in several series of several hundred pregnancies. 90 percent of asymptomatic women pre-pregnancy will remain asymptomatic during pregnancy. It is important to remember the, the importance of the systolic and diastolic function. And if you have severe systolic dysfunction, as for any other cause, you should advise against pregnancy. If you have severe diastolic dysfunction, the woman is very unlikely to tolerate the volume expansion of pregnancy. And so that is a significant contraindication. And if you have severe LV outflow tract obstruction, that should be treated pre-pregnancy. In these series, generally the only very few women who've died are those who have had one of these complications. So as you know, having an ICD is no bar to pregnancy. You just deactivate it for a caesarean if necessary. Anything, any medication management that she's on like a beta blocker should be continued through pregnancy. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy tolerate AF very poorly, as you know, and so if somebody goes into atrial fibrillation, it's no different from the non-pregnant state. She should be cardioverted promptly. So if there's diastolic dysfunction, the problem with fluid overload will lead to pulmonary edema. And if there's LV outflow tract obstruction, underfilling will worsen that. So the general advice for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for delivery planning is to keep the woman euvolemic to replace fluid losses, but not to either overfill or underfill her. And if she has an epidural and she has outflow tract obstruction, if you do a low dose, slowly titrated epidural, it has minimal effect on the systolic blood pressure and the SVR. So you're going to hear later about peripartum cardiomyopathy. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the woman who you know has pre-existing dilated cardiomyopathy of another cause. And it is, again, one of these situations in which pre-pregnancy functional capacity is a very important indicator. So if you have mild LV impairment and good functional capacity, that's low to moderate risk. So that's your WHO two to three. Whereas if you have severe LV, and LV impairment with an ejection fraction of 30 percent or less and your NYHA class three to four, that's very high risk WHO four. And sadly, unlike some of the other high risk conditions, it's not one you can just intervene on before pregnancy to change that risk. A pre-pregnancy exercise test, I think, is really important to make an objective assessment of functional capacity. Some people's asymptomatic, um, if some people are very sedentary or have become used to being limited, you know, may actually be not asymptomatic at all when you make an objective assessment. As you know, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated in pregnancy, so you stop those before, but you continue the beta blocker. 
and important to consider the fact that pregnancy itself is a thrombogenic state, so to consider the need for anticoagulation. But in these women with good functional capacity with only mild stable LV impairment, monitored and optimally medically treated, they should expect a normal vaginal delivery at term, no need to plan for anything else and generally the outcomes are very good. ARVC is another condition in which pregnancy is generally very well tolerated. I've put up some data here. One of these is from a meta-analysis in HEART in 2019, and then the other is a recent uh, study on the Nordic ARVC registry. So I think that the important take home messages here are there were no deaths, no deaths in either study. Um, the arrhythmia rate, it seems to be extremely variable, but until you look at the number of women in each, in each cohort. So although this looks like 33% of women had VT. There were only three women. This is one woman. So I think this is probably more useful to look at that 4% of women in this larger series had VT. That's probably the amount of VT they would have had anyway if they weren't pregnant. And so this is what the Nordic registry found that the arrhythmia rate was actually the same as background. And also importantly, when thinking ahead for women planning their, their lives and their families, the fact that you've had pregnancy didn't seem to progress your ARVC, so you didn't become worse quicker if you'd had pregnancies than if you did. And flecainide is safe in pregnancy. So in contrast to the things we've spoken about, restrictive cardiomyopathy unfortunately is not well tolerated in pregnancy. This is a situation where there's very little evidence and there's case reports only. I think what one can definitely say is that if a woman is symptomatic pre-pregnancy, she will not tolerate the 50% volume expansion. And that is a situation where unless this is treatable, which as we all know, sadly, it generally isn't, it's manageable but not treatable, um, then this is a case to advise against pregnancy. In uh, Although you can, you can assess the increase in cardiac output in pregnancy by exercise testing. You can simulate that. You really can't assess the increase in blood volume. There's no other way that you can do that prior to pregnancy. Um, so it's not something I think that you can easily assess. So I would very strongly advise against pregnancy in someone who was symptomatic or already on diuretics. And in an asymptomatic mild case, I think you have to make an individual assessment. Let's spend five minutes talking about aortic dissection. Pregnancy is a perfect storm for aortic dissection. The changes you've heard about in one of the previous talks, together with the change in the extracellular matrix, does significantly increase the risk of aortic dissection. And some studies like this one I've quoted here would, uh, would suggest that up to 25, 25 times the non-pregnant risk. What we know is that although it's higher risk in aortopathy, it can also occur in a normal aorta. All of antenatal management in this situation is dissection risk reduction. That's what we're trying to do. I think a wider question you know, outside this talk really is, are we missing women at risk? Are we picking up women with the right family history at booking or pre-pregnancy? Are we making sure that women have had the correct pre-pregnancy counselling and risk management? And as I'm sure you know, those of you who are cardiologists and obstetricians, perhaps di diagnosis of acute dissection remains very poor because of failure to consider it, hence think aorta. So preconception, what this is a very useful table from the ESC guidelines and what it's really is a couple of points it's making, which is I think the, these ESC guidelines are particularly useful because they were the first to actually distinguish between different diagnoses because different diagnoses are associated with different risks. Marfan, Lois Dietz and vascular EDS is much higher risk than the bicuspid valve. They've, this paper puts the, the, the risk for turners as the same. I think probably the risk for turners is less than the risk for these three conditions, but there's much less data to, to, uh, to compare. So what this is saying is that the, the cutoffs for when you should advise not to become pregnant or you know, more positively advised to intervene prior to pregnancy are different according to your different diagnoses. So five centimetres for the bicuspid, 4.5 for Marfan's or four if you have a malignant family history. In Turner, which I know is not the remit of this talk as it's not inherited, um, we, we, we index the aortic dimensions because the women are often of very small stature. <laughs> 
And in these guidelines, the, the indications for Lois Dietz are the same as Marfan, but something we know far less about because the correlation between dissection risk and aortic size seems much less strong in Lois Dietz than it does in Marfan. So just a word about the bicuspid aortic valve. It's very common. It's associated with aortopathy. And what I wanted to point out to you is that because of the effacement of the sinotubular junction, the whole shape of the ascending aorta is different and therefore the proximal of the aortic root and the ascending aorta. And therefore the widest point may be the ascending and not the sinus of valsalva. So when you're assessing a woman with a bicuspid aortic valve, you do need to make sure you are assessing the widest point of the aorta because it is the widest point of the aorta that defines risk and that risk may be that may be the defining risk for the pregnancy and nothing to do with the valve itself. There is a 10% recurrence and so screening should be offered. Marfan syndrome, there is conflicting evidence on aortic root growth in pregnancy. Uh, we seem to have a general idea that the overall dissection risk is three, about 3% three um, and that the dissection risk is higher for a larger root. And there's good agreement on relative safety less than 4.5 centimetres as long as there are no additional risk factors. So this is the aortic root growth data, two different studies, one showing that if you become pregnant, your aortic root doesn't grow. And the other showing that if you become pregnant, which is here, the, the brown, your aortic root grows more than if, it, if you weren't pregnant, which is the blue. So conflicting evidence there. But I think these are the important things. There is a dissection risk that is higher than background. It's important to know that and there is a general agreement that below that level is safe to proceed with the appropriate management as long as you don't have a malignant history, family history. Vascular EDS, um, the maternal death rate is 5% and there's a significantly high rate of life-threatening complications which are not only cardiovascular but include uterine rupture. That is much higher than the general population. But interestingly, this study shows that your overall survival with vascular EDS is unaffected by pregnancies. These are people who've never had a pregnancy. These are women who have had a pregnancy. And here we have no difference in the survival. So, you know, although the, the complication rate is high, is that the complication rate that she would have had anyway, lifetime, and therefore should we advise against it? difficult philosophical decision, discussion, but current advice is that you should advise against it. So these are the tables from the ESC guidelines on the management of aortic disease. I just want to pick out, you know, just a couple of points here. They should all have counselling. They should all have the entire aorta imaged, preferably by MRI or CT prior to pregnancy. Um, we've spoken about bicuspid valve and it's the importance of blood pressure control. This is the importance of regular repeat imaging during pregnancy. And if you're not seeing everything you need to do with echo, that should be MRI scan. Um, and this is about delivery now. So if you have an ascending aorta of less than 40, definitely vaginal. If you're above the aorta, when they say ascending, they mean the widest point. Caesarean delivery should be considered. And then when you're in between, you've got the freedom to think about both. And in my practice, I would do that with, with vaginal delivery and considering an epidural for an expedited second stage. Another risk factor is obviously if the if the aorta is increasing in size, that's important too. Uh, we've spoken about vascular EDS. If the woman continues, then saliprolol as proven outside pregnancy should be continued. Beta blockers should be continued in other women. There's very little evidence about this, but we think that it, by reducing the shear stress on the aorta, it will reduce the risk of dissection. These are the people that it's not recommended in that I've spoken about, and this is what we spoke about, vascular EDS. So I think the key points about aortic dilatation really are that the risk is defined by the diagnosis and the widest dimension of the aorta and not just there's not just a one size fits all and other factors like hypertension and family history are also really important. The beta blocker may reduce risk by reducing the shear stress. Regular imaging and tight control of blood pressure is really important. You know that MRI is safe in all trimesters, gadolinium is not. I think I would go as far as to say, we will, I definitely would go as far as to say that CT should be performed if dissection is suspected. The radiation of CT is far less significant than making a correct diagnosis of aortic dissection. 
Delivery, as we've heard, depends on diagnosis, dimension and change in dimension. And please remember the non-cardiac complications of connective tissue disease, for example, postpartum hemorrhage and uterine rupture in EDS form. Iron channel disorders, we just really need to, to mention very briefly because basically you manage them as normal, you continue the medication as normal, and you continue the main issue in pregnancy is awareness of the restrictions on medication in conditions like Brugada and long QT, appropriate use of credible meds, brugadadrugs.org. So it's really from the anaesthetist point of view, understanding what drugs will be contraindicated. Um, postpartum seems to be a particularly high risk period for women with long QT syndrome, uh, thought that it might be to do with sleep deprivation and many of the deaths that occur occur in that period. And so it's absolutely crucial if the woman doesn't have an ICD and is managed on the beta blocker that she understands how important it is to continue that. So really just the key message is as a summary that Obstetric care for the woman with a cardiac condition must begin with expert pre-pregnancy counselling. We've discussed the fact that there are very few cardiac indications for caesarean section, that beta blockers aren't contraindicated in pregnancy, and that there are conditions which are generally extremely well tolerated if the woman is well, and those are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC, and dilated cardiomyopathy with good functional status and only mildly impaired LV function. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, unfortunately, is a different story and is generally very, has the potential to be very poorly tolerated and probably should be advised against. LV non-compaction I haven't discussed as a separate entity, but you manage it as its constituent part. So you manage the thromboembolic risk, the arrhythmia risk and the LV. Aortic risk is defined by diagnosis, history and dimension. And in iron channel disease, it's really the medication awareness that is key. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Head. What a, what a wonderful talk. Uh, everything we needed to hear. Um, and I'll just make a plug on your behalf uh, about the UK Maternal Cardiology Society. Thank you. Uh, everyone should uh, should join. Um, there, when is the, the meeting later in the year? So we have our next major meeting is November, November the 22nd. That will be a whole day meeting. That's an educational meeting. Um, and then we often have intervening webinars as well that we will advertise. And perhaps we could advertise through this group, Antonia. That would be excellent. So our mm. next major planned meeting, we've just had a meeting at the British Cardiac Society and our next major planned meeting is 22nd of November. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Head. Thank you for your time.